This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Getting a vaccine shot is a really fun way to figure out whether you have needle hesitancy, and I may or may not be speaking from experience. Here's what we got for y'all. A little known police training board is coming into focus in the trial of former Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin. We'll tell you more about what this board does and why some are calling for changes. Plus officials at the US Southern border are apprehending people in record numbers, but so many more are still eluding authorities. We have a story on what impact that's had on migration and law enforcement. But first, here's what you need to know right now. A few weeks ago, after two highly covered mass shootings, President Biden said taking action on gun violence in the US was a matter of timing. Turns out that timing is right now. This is an epidemic for God's sake, and it has to stop. So I'm here to talk about two things. First, the steps we're gonna take immediately. And second, the action that needs to be taken going forward to curb the epidemic of gun violence. Those actions include a proposed rule to stem the proliferation of ghost guns or homemade firearms that don't have serial numbers and can't be traced, a proposed rule to regulate stabilizing braces, a proposed model for a national so-called red flag law, an annual report on firearms trafficking, and investment in evidence-based community violence interventions. That last one is major within gun violence prevention groups. More than 40,000 people a year are killed by gun violence, and mass shootings where four or more people are killed is only a fraction of that number. High casualty shootings where four or more people are shot are more common, and community violence intervention efforts are seen as a way to curb those. Biden also nominated David Chipman as ATF director. Chipman is a senior policy advisor at Giffords, a gun safety group, and a former ATF agent. He's previously testified in front of the House Judiciary Committee on more strictly regulating so-called assault weapons. If confirmed, He'll be the first permanent director since 2015. Before finishing his remarks, Biden also rehashed one of his campaign promises to re-up on an assault weapons ban, much like the one that was in place from 1994 to 2004. Of course, gun rights groups and some Republican legislators aren't really vibing with what Biden laid out. Representative Kevin McCarthy, the minority leader for the House of Representatives, said on Twitter, President Biden wants to trample over our constitutional Second Amendment rights by executive fiat. He is soft on crime, but infringes on the rights of law-abiding citizens. We should note the proposed rules won't be enacted right away. They've got a bit of a journey before that happens, and they'll likely be challenged in court. In the meantime, Biden urged lawmakers to move forward on bills that pass the House, one to expand background checks, another to close the so-called Charleston loophole, and one more to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act and close the so-called boyfriend loophole. The more contagious COVID strain first detected in the UK is now the dominant strain in the US. More cases of two other concerning variants first detected in South Africa and Brazil are also popping up across the country. Right now, five states are seeing a pretty serious surge in infections. In Michigan, cases in hospitalizations more than doubled over the last two weeks. The good news is that millions of Americans continue to get a COVID vaccine daily. Nearly 20% of the US population has been fully vaccinated according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The thing is, scientists worry that these variants pose a new challenge that could draw out the pandemic. It's almost a race between getting people vaccinating and this surge that seems to want to increase and do what's going on, for example, in Europe. Much of Europe went into a lockdown around Easter to try and curb surges from the variant first found in the UK. The OG airlines have another reason to watch their backs with a newcomer called Avello now cleared for takeoff. The new airline pegs itself as a low cost carrier. When I looked around online, there were limited flight options, but tickets were cheap. There is a $10 check bag fee though. They always get you with those. Avello flights start April 11th and they will mainly cater to markets in the Western US. According to the International Air Travel Association, the pandemic cost the airline industry more than $380 billion. So you might be wondering, is now really the best time to debut a new airline? Well, the latest data from the TSA shows Americans are flying at the highest number seen in a year, and American Airlines says their current bookings are nearly on par with 2019. As more people get vaccinated, air travel is only expected to increase more, but so will competition in the skies. There is another airline waiting to take off, Breeze Airways says it will fly to, quote, neglected and forgotten markets, but locations haven't been revealed. It expects to make its debut next month. 
Many of the intricacies of police procedure and conduct have come under intense scrutiny during the Derek Chauvin trial. With attorneys on both sides honing in on use of force, they've also directed their attention to a little known state agency that oversees training and licensing for all police in Minnesota. Newsy's Angela Hill investigates what they do and how well they do it. Derek Chauvin isn't the only one on trial this month. So is the state of policing in Minneapolis. The system itself has to come out and say, we apologize. We want to work with you. We want to own the mistakes we have done. Community leader Raj Saturaju says police reform isn't enough. The system needs to be transformed. They want police officers who will come and be a partner with them in the process of creating a sense of safety, so repairing the harm, restoring people's humanity, and then together reforming so the community is at the table. When you do all of those things, you are transforming the system. Any transformation requires change to an obscure state agency that oversees licensing and training of police officers. It's called the Minnesota Peace Officers Standards and Training Board, or the Post Board. We all know the system does not have a conscience. Elected officials and community leaders say the post board lacks real authority with no oversight over department level training and the inability to collect complete data about complaints against officers across the state. These critical reforms are long overdue. They are meant to strengthen transparency and community oversight. Last July, the legislature passed a police reform bill that bolsters the post board's oversight of the more than 400 law enforcement departments in Minnesota. How do we move toward ensuring in an actionable way that there's consistent uh, standards that are being adhered to, uh, the public knows uh, that uh, all these units can be held uh, accountable to. State Representative Carlos Mariani was one of the authors of that legislation. Some of the changes include banning warrior-style training in certain chokeholds, requiring officers to intervene if they witness improper use of force, and making sure those who train officers are qualified. Eric Misselt is the executive director of the Minnesota Post Board. A lot of that is in process. A lot of our focus is going to be on transparency. In the most contentious reform, long opposed by police departments and police unions, law enforcement agencies across the state will need to provide detailed complaint information against officers to the post board. It will provide good objective data on what, is, what do complaints look like across the state, what sort of things are being reported what action is being taken by agencies, what action should be taken by the post board. Community members say this is a step in the right direction, but that the reforms haven't gone far enough. The board is legally prohibited from telling the public how many officers are investigated for misconduct or which officers it's investigating. It can't even confirm if the board is investigating Officer Derek Chauvin, who's on trial for murder and manslaughter. The only time we can uh, give anything that would be public concerning officer licensure matters is when there's final discipline imposed by the board. As the only agency that can prevent a bad officer from working in the state, activists say the board needs to be much more transparent as it investigates police misconduct. The optics are bad. Right, because we are at a point where we cannot strip you of your profession yet. There ain't no justice here in this town. You can go somewhere else, right? And if they want to hire you, they can hire you because you're still a licensed officer. Angela Hill, Newsy, Washington. When you're back, we'll punch in our favorite multi-hit combo and dive into the world of tech and gaming. One of gaming's biggest events is back, and you don't have to pay or even leave your home to attend. We're diving to the world of tech and previously canceled gaming expos with one of our favorite segments, Next Level Speed Run, starting with this. After taking the last year off, the biggest gaming expo in town is back as a virtual event. The Electronic Entertainment Expo, or E3, used to be a massive in-person showcase for all the big gaming companies to hype up their latest games with lavish PR stunts. Please welcome Keanu Reeves. 
But after COVID canceled last year's event, E3 is moving this year's festivities online and rebranding from an expo to an experience. Industry titans like Microsoft, Nintendo, and Ubisoft have confirmed they're participating in the show, but major console maker Sony is opting out of E3 for the second time in a row, preferring to rely on their in-house virtual events. The show runs from June 13th to the 15th, registration for fans opens in the very vague spring 2021. Hopefully next year E3 can get back to its roots of cramming a bunch of gamers together for a weekend. Streaming giant Twitch is trying to crack down on its harassment issues, even ones that don't occur on the site itself. In a blog post, the company says it'll now regularly take off-site behavior into account when deciding whether to punish someone for misconduct. So serious offenses on Twitter or other platforms could get a user kicked off of Twitch. For the most part, acting up outside of Twitch won't get you banned unless it's paired with Twitch-based misconduct. But violent extremism, underage exploitation and threats against the site staff are deemed serious enough to incur punishment even if they don't happen on Twitch. Twitch says it's retained a third-party investigative law firm to scope out these kinds of complaints, which could help it be more consistent in cracking down on off-site misconduct. Look, we can't really call this segment speedrun without occasionally covering some actual speedrunning news. And this week, we got another reminder just how scarily good some people are at Mario games. Oh my god! Yes! Yes, dude! What? Oh my god! Speedrunner Nifsky set a new world record this week for clearing the original Super Mario Brothers game. His time was 4 minutes, 54 seconds, and 948 milliseconds, just over 250 milliseconds better than the previous record. If you don't care about gaming, you might be asking, so what? Well, to put this into perspective, topping the record speed run on Super Mario Brothers is like the video game equivalent of breaking the four minute mile. It's an incredible sporting achievement. This new record stretches the limits of how fast humans can play Mario. A perfect speed run plotted out by a computer could only beat the game a half second faster than Nifsky's time. There's something about Mario games that just makes people want to push them to their limits. Go look up what a half A press is if you don't believe me. New numbers out Thursday show the U.S. government picked up nearly 19,000 children traveling to the border. That's just for March. That's the largest monthly number ever recorded. As migration to the southern border continues to swell, there's also a number of people getting into the country undetected. Right now, it's roughly 1,000 people a day. Newsy's Ben Shimizo sat down with the head of the National Border Patrol Union to talk about the people they call gotaways. For Border Patrol, the term gotaways refers to migrants who are able to sneak into the country without being identified or apprehended. Right now, we have about 6,000 people that are crossing our borders illegally every single day. Of those 6,000, 1,000 of them are getting away. Union President Brendan Judd says though agents have never been able to detain everyone at the border, he's never seen that many people evade capture before. We have no idea who they are. We don't know what threat they pose to the American public. How do you know the number of people who come so across they're, undetected? They're not crossing undetected. These are a thousand people that are in fact detected. We just weren't able to apprehend them. Like in this customs and border protection video, Judd says smugglers often abandon kids and families in strategic areas to overburden agents and create gaps elsewhere. If they flood the border with illegal border crossers uh, of unaccompanied children, of family units, they know darn good and well that our hands are going to be tied up and they're going to be able to create those artificial gaps. And those artificial gaps are going to allow them to cross the people, those thousand people per day. Judd has been in the Border Patrol for over 20 years and speaks on behalf of around 18,000 officers. He was a supporter and close ally of President Donald Trump. Now he's a vocal critic of President Biden's policies, which he blames for the migration surge. He says that there are surges every year. That's true to some extent. But we've never seen a surge day over day, week over week, month over month, 
increase like what we're currently seeing right now. New official data shows the U.S. arrested and detained over 172,000 migrants at the southern border in March, a 15-year high and a 71% increase from February. While most migrants were swiftly expelled under a pandemic emergency policy, a soaring number of unaccompanied minors and families with young kids have been allowed to stay in the U.S. under supervision. It's inhumane to give this perception, which then becomes reality that our borders are open, that you're going to get released into the United States. And as long as we continue to have that perception, people are going to come and they're going to try to cross the borders illegally. The Biden administration says the border is not open and it's doing its best to expel as many migrants as possible while rebuilding the immigration system it says was dismantled by the Trump administration. Ben Chamiso, Newsy. When you're back, we'll talk about the risks of getting things back to normal, even after you've been fully vaccinated. It's likely pretty tempting to go back to normal once you're fully vaccinated. I wouldn't know just yet because I'm only halfway there. But as we know, there's still a risk in everything you do. Newsy's Lindsay Thies talked to the experts about the prospect of getting infected while kicking it with a few buds after being fully vaccinated. Turns out there's a lot of factors to consider, even with a small gathering. With more and more people getting the COVID-19 vaccine, you may be asking yourself, what's my risk of catching the virus? We asked the experts, what's the risk of a small gathering of 10 people or less after the vaccine? Their take, contracting COVID-19 is low risk. It's really where you're going and what you're doing there that puts people at risk. It really depends on how many households would be involved, who's going and are they vaccinated? Or if not, are they at high risk for severe disease? If there's more than two households or there are unvaccinated people with high risk conditions, the risk of that situation rises up into the moderate, if not high risk category. If those 10 people were vaccinated themselves, then there's zero risk, um, according to the CDC. And if those 10 people are a member of a single household, uh, then that's also okay. To learn more about what is low, medium, and high risk, visit newsy.com slash what's the risk. Unemployment claims are on the rise again. It's nowhere near where we were this time last year, but at least 9 million Americans are currently in need of work. Still, some companies with openings are struggling to get employees. National reporter Alicia Nieves looks into the labor shortage and one of the industries getting hit hard by it. The restaurant industry has never been an easy business. I've been in the restaurant business since high school. Fred Morgan spent most of his life managing restaurant chains around the country. But eight years ago, he decided to start a small pizza chain of his own. We opened our first three locations in the first four months and um, haven't really looked back. Fired Pie has grown to 21 locations in Arizona and was about to expand to other states. And then, of course, pandemic hit. And it was really um, scary. I mean, it, it you know, uh, I thank goodness for the PP, first PPP loan. It really saved us. When vaccines started to roll out in states like Arizona allowed indoor dining at 50% and now 100%, Morgan was excited to ramp back up and hire more staff again. All of a sudden, 